Can I just say, wow, what a privilege and what an honor it is to be back at West Florida, back home. Uh, God did so many amazing things during our time here uh, in the panhandle of Florida. Uh, man, again, I could, I could sit here and I'm just, my mind is being flooded by so many, so many good things. Sure, there were challenges and sure, there were difficulties along the way. And I screwed up many, many times. Uh, but God was so good and he's so faithful uh, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be, be with you this morning and share about what God is doing. Uh, before we get into our passage, we're going to spend the majority of our time here just in 1 Samuel 14, about the first 10 verses. But I want to take a step back in, into chapter 13 and kind of give you a little bit of context. This is a passage of scripture I heard probably about a year ago, but God really used it in an amazing way. It's an amazing story about how God uses the faith of a single person to literally change the trajectory of an entire nation. Uh, it's a story about how God used a, a young man by the name of Jonathan. We'll hear about him in a little bit. But a simple step of faith, of, of, of initiative, of, of bold initiative that he took and that God used to bring about an incredible victory and about how God uses us as we take steps of faith to follow him, how he in turn responds in power uh, and does a great work. And so this morning, I want to share just some simple thoughts. But before we get into to our main passage, I want to give you kind of what's going on. If you, if you go back one chapter to chapter 13, of course, the, the book of Sam, uh, 1 Samuel is, is named after the, the prophet Samuel. He was really started out as a priest. There's an incredible story about how God used the faith of his mother uh, who prayed for a son. And God gave her a son, and she made a promise to give him back to God and took him to the temple where he became a priest and, and served the Lord there. He became one of the what is known as probably one of the last judges of Israel. See, before this time in Israel's history, they'd, they'd been ruled not by kings, but by judges or leaders. People like, you know, Moses and Joshua. And of course, you have the book of Judges, guys like Samson, uh, incredible leaders. They weren't kings, but they were leaders that God raised up during a specific time in Israel's history to bring about salvation or, or freedom from their enemies. And so Samuel was the last judge. And the, the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, was really the it's almost like a historical book telling about the very beginning of Israel's monarch or the king, kingly line. See, Israel got to the point where they said, you know, we'd like to be like other nations. We want a king. And so God warns them through Samuel. He says, you know what? Here's what's going to happen if you want a king. Because up until this point, I, God was their king. God was their leader. And by, by asking for a king, they were, in a sense, rejecting God's uh, uh, leadership over their, over, their, over their kingdom. And so God, God warns them. He says, you know what? If you have a king... Here's what he's going to do. He's going to tax you. He's going to take your stuff. He's going to take your sons and daughters and, and become his servants. He's going, to, he's, going to, he's going to take your lands. And they said, no, oh, we don't care. We want a king. And so Samuel says, okay, we're going, to, we're going to give you a king. And the first king's name, you might have heard it before, is a guy by the name of Saul. And Saul reigns for just a couple of years. The beginning of chapter 13 says, in verse number one, Saul reigned one year, and when he reigned two years over Israel. So one plus two is three. Very good. Give yourselves a hand. Give yourself a hand. That's the hardest question you'll have to answer this morning, I promise you. So he's reigned three years, short time, not been king a long time, but there's already some pretty major issues. If you read through the first couple of verses of chapter 13, they're Israel's kind of longtime enemy, the Philistines, right? And actually really similar to if you read the news that's going on now, a lot of these places and uh, these people that are having conflict even have carried on until, until present day. Literally, the Gaza Strip is Philistine territory. So this goes all the way back to Bible times. There's conflict here. Uh, the Philistines had come over and kind of taken some territory. And so Saul is, is the leader of the army. He's the commander-in-chief. Of course, his son, Jonathan, is kind of his second in command or uh, the prince of Israel. And so he leads a, a, what we'd probably call a raid against the Philistines and, and uh, defeats this uh, Philistine outpost in the first couple of verses of chapter 13. The Philistines, uh, they're not super excited about how Jonathan defeated their outpost. So they said, okay, you want to play games? Let's play games. And so they raise up this massive army uh, in verses um, 5 and 6. You can begin to read. The Philistines gather together to fight to Israel. In verse 5, it says 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. They don't even bother putting a number on the number of foot soldiers they had because there's so many. So it was a lot. Massive army chariots would be basically like cavalry and it would be kind of the time of tanks, right? They have this huge army. Uh, Saul, on the other hand, only has a few thousand men with him. If you go back to verse number two, you kind of tell Saul has 2,000 men and there's 1,000 with Jonathan. So he has 3,000 dudes against 
question mark, question mark. Massive army. The, the, the numbers are not in their favor. So, again, put yourselves in the shoes of an Israelite soldier. Um, we're there. Oh, by the way, to Israel, if you go to the bottom, the end of chapter 13 and verse 22, uh, it says that there was not a sword or a spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul or Jonathan, but with Saul and Jonathan, his son there was found. So no one in the entire Israelite army, not only were they massively outnumbered, but they also had no weapons. It's pretty hard to fight a war with no weapons, right? So huge army, you have no weapons, way smaller amount of people. So what do you think is the natural response of the Israelite army? Take a guess. What do you think? Bye. <laughs> they run. Again, kind of makes sense in a way. Huge army. We have no weapons. We're basically going to die. Uh, and they, they, start, they start running. In verse number 6 of chapter 13, they hide themselves in caves, thickets, rocks, high places, and pits. In verse 7, some of them even go over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead, basically kind of go to enemy territory, Right? And the people that did stay behind in the end of verse 7 says, all the people that were following him followed him trembling. So it's kind of in a tough situation, right? What, what are we going to do? Well, as is what you would make a lot of sense, Saul's army uh, is running, huge army problem. They're going to go ask God for help. All good to this point, right? You begin to read in verse number 8. It says, uh, and he tarried seven days according to the time that Samuel had appointed. Remember, Samuel was the, was the, was the prophet, was the priest of Israel. They were going to cry out to God for help. And there was this particular sacrifice that was going to be offered called a burnt offering. The issue with the offering was that it had to be, it had to be administered uh, or supposed to be administered according to God's commandments uh, by the priest. So Samuel says, hey, I'm going to show up. We're going we're to ask God for help. And of course, God had met their needs before many times. So they said, okay, great. We're going to wait seven days. But seven days pass and no Samuel uh, in verse number, uh, verse number eight there. He doesn't, he doesn't show up. And so verse nine, Saul makes a really critical mistake. He says, all right, let's do it. Samuel's not here. My guys are running away. Bring me the sacrifice. In direct violation of God's express command. Can I just say, when you take matters into your own hands, it normally doesn't end well but especially when God has given you a specific command and you violate, you say, you know what, things are bad, things are going difficult for me, so you know what, I'm gonna take matters into my own hands. But that's what Saul does. Guess who shows up right after Saul does the thing he was not supposed to do? Samuel. It's kind of like when you're little, you know, in your home and, and your, your mom and dad says, don't do this thing, and then you do the thing, and guess who shows up right when you did the thing you're not supposed to do? Mom and dad. I've caught my children many times that way. Don't do that. Don't fight. Don't, don't open this or don't read that or don't eat that. And I walk away for two minutes. I come back and they're doing the thing that I just told them not to do. That's what Saul. So Saul, of course, like we all do, what does he do? He tries to blame other people. Oh, you know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, my guys are running away. Uh, they did this. And he even said, he goes so far as to say, I forced myself to do this. I had no choice. He even tries to blame Samuel. And Samuel says, you know what? You did foolishly. Not only was it not only, if you just waited, God would have blessed you. God would have, he even said, he tells Saul in the later verse, he says, God would have established your kingdom forever, but because you chose to disregard his command, now your kingdom will not continue. And God's gonna seek for someone else, a man after his own heart, which we come to know later on as, as David, to take your place. So things, again, are going pretty terribly for Saul and for Israel at this time. The army's deserted, Saul has basically just found out that he's not going to be king for much longer. Where are they at? Kind of hopeless. Kind of a hopeless situation. And then, chapter 14. And in chapter 14, we're going to see how, John, how God uses the faith of Jonathan to do something really incredible. Just three simple, uh, three simple points from, from chapter 14. Uh, about God's power, and there's, I'll give them to you real quickly. Number one, it's going to be Jonathan's bold initiative. Two is Jonathan's confidence in God. And then three, how Jonathan then became a catalyst for God's deliverance. So let's pick up in, in chapter 14, verse number one. Let's pray real quickly and ask God to bless us. Uh, we're running short on time, so I'm gonna, again, I'm going to talk fast, but let's ask God to work in our lives this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, what an incredible privilege it is to know you 
to serve you, uh, Lord, to be a part of the work that you're doing in the world. I'm so grateful for your word, Lord, how we have examples of, of faith. Uh, Lord, how you've proven yourself time and time again, Lord. I pray that this morning that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, I know that nothing that I have prepared or will say today will be of any value unless your Holy Spirit works, Lord. This is your word. These are your people. This is your church. Lord, I pray that you would speak now. Lord, I pray that you'd use me, enable me to communicate, Lord, what it is that you desire to communicate this morning. Lord, you know every need, you know every heart, you know every challenge, every situation, difficulties that are being faced in this room, Lord. Uh, Lord, that I have zero idea about, but you do. Lord, I pray that you would work uh, in a mighty way, Lord. Speak to me even as we look into your word, Lord, that you would use uh, your word in a mighty way in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So number one, like I said, John, we see Jonathan, just three simple points again. Number one, Jonathan's bold initiative. Look at verse number one of chapter 14. The Bible says this, Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over to the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. See, Jonathan made, made a move. He realized that, you know what, if, if something's going to happen, there's going to have to be some steps taken. While the army, majority of the army had abandoned, was, was walking in fear, was, was running and hiding, Jonathan says, you know what, I need to take a step towards the enemy rather than away. You know, kind of your natural, kind of our tendency would be, hey, there's danger, there's problems, there's issues over there. I'm going to go the opposite way. I'm going to go, go to a different place, which is what most people were doing. Again, we see a contrast here between Jonathan and even not only the people of Israel, but also his own father, Saul, the commander in chief, the king, the one who was actually supposed to be leading the way. Look at verse number two. It says, Saul tarried in the uttermost part. I love the Bible, actually, how, they, how God adds these words. He says, Saul tarried in the uttermost part, which is just basically means, I take it as like the furthest part you could go. It's almost as if Saul says, you know what, I'm going to go as far away from the danger as I can. Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree. He's hanging out under a tree, which in a way sounds kind of nice. Pomegranate tree, right? There's, there's shade. You got some food to eat. And it's probably relatively safe and secure, right? See, the difference between Saul and Jonathan was that Saul saw a big problem, but Jonathan saw an opportunity. Saul's paralyzed by fear, by doubt, by uncertainty, and Jonathan presses forward in faith. You know, and I wonder, I thought about, I thought about my own life. How often have I chosen, rather than to move forward to something that may be difficult or that is uncertain or maybe possibly even dangerous to me, I've chosen to choose the place of relative safety and security under the pomegranate tree. But you know what? It's not going to happen under the pomegranate tree. That's not where the battle's going to be fought. The battle's going to be fought on the battlefield. Jonathan realized, I'm not going to run into any Philistines over here under the pomegranate tree where dad's hanging out. Yeah, it may be nice. It may be relatively safe and secure. I've got some, 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 some creature comforts that I can enjoy here. But that's not where the victory is going to happen. That's not the place where God is going to do his work. Jonathan realized, you know, Jonathan's decision to make a move forward, it put him in a place to where God could use him. And again, how often have we missed out on seeing God's power because rather than go to somewhere or into a situation that might be a little uncomfortable, a little uncertain, we're not really quite sure, we choose rather to kind of take a step back when we should be moving forward. God does his greatest work when we rely and trust in him. Keep going down to verse number four with me. So Jonathan's moving forward, right, towards the enemy. He takes this bold initiative. Verse number four says, between the passages which Jonathan sought to go over under the Philistine garrison, there's a sharp rock on one side, a sharp rock on the other side. The name of, was Bozes and the other of Senna. You know, this is kind of an interesting verse because I, you know, I, read, I read it and I'm like, you know, this is kind of weird. Why, why, why is this Bozes and Senna? What's, what's the point of, of, of this in the story? It's kind of just an odd little addition. You know what happens if you Google Bozes and Senna, what you'll find? Can you uh, 
Put that picture up there, Anna. You'll find this. This place exists even till today. Isn't God amazing how he puts little details in the Bible? Just in case you were wondering if this is a real story, it is. And if you could imagine, not only did Jonathan's decision to move forward take him into danger, but it actually wasn't an easy path. You got the Philistines on one side, and you got the Israelites on the other side, right? They're separated by this valley. Actually, it's, it's the same part of Israel where in just a few years later, a young boy named David's going to meet a giant named Goliath with just five stones and a sling. So the path wasn't easy, but it's almost as if God is saying, hey, I want to give you a, a little bit of an insight into not only is this a true story, but about, about what Jonathan had to go through. There's even a cool story, if you, if you do some research on this, where in World War I, there was this British colonel who had a Bible, and he was reading the story of Jonathan. They were fighting the Turks in this area of Israel at the time, and he actually used the intel, I guess, from the Bible to say, oh, Jonathan, they, there was this gorge and this valley between the two and these rocks, and they actually used that information to basically flank and get behind uh, the enemy Turks that they were fighting and win a battle, which is kind of a, a cool little story. Uh, we won't take time to get into, but just how incredible God is, right? Bose says and Senna still exist today. Jonathan chooses to move forward. He goes in a path that's not easy, which again, taking a step of faith is often not the most comfortable, easy to do. Right? That's why, that's why we avoid it. But again, that's often and most of the time where God wants us, exactly where he wants us to be. So Jonathan takes bold initiative, moves forward uh, in faith. And then number two, in verse, and we pick it up in verse number six. So we see Jonathan's bold initiative. He, takes, he makes the move. He moves forward. Number two, we see Jonathan's confidence in God. Read verse number six with me. It says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. See, Jonathan's first step puts him, takes him away from safety and puts him kind of into the, into the, into the battlefield, the danger zone, right? Into a place where he potentially comes face to face uh, with his enemy. But what's interesting to me about that is that Jonathan clearly didn't know what the specific outcome would be. Because he says, it may be. You see, Jonathan's step of faith was really faith because he had no idea what the outcome. God had spoken before, right? God had used the prophets and, and Samuel even. You know, God would speak and say, here, do this thing and this, this will be the result, right? That happened, happens many times in scripture, but not here. Samuel hadn't come to, to Jonathan and said, Jonathan, I want you to go across and, and attack the enemy and I'll be with you and I'll give you victory and you'll win and it'll be all great. Everyone will, will cheer and you'll be the great hero. Not here. Jonathan didn't know that. He didn't have a word from the Lord. He didn't have a clear command. All he knew was that God was able. See, sometimes when we wait for this specific, you know, writing in the sky from God, when oftentimes I think God is just waiting for us to take a step of faith towards him. We're waiting for this, like, a sign, a prophet, someone to come and say, hey, Ben, you should do this or do that. This is what I have for you. When God is just waiting, he's looking for people. Because there's a lot of things that Jonathan didn't know if he would live. He didn't know if he would win the battle. He didn't know a lot of stuff. But again, what did he know? He clearly knew that he served a God that was able. Because his own statement here says, the Lord may, will work for us for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. You look back and there's, there's something really amazing back in chapter 12. Flip back a couple of pages to chapter 12. Because again, ask the question, there's a difference, you know, between knowing something and believing it, right? I can know something to be true, but unless I'm willing to actually risk something for it, I'm willing to actually act upon that knowledge, I don't actually probably really believe it though, right? Jonathan knew God was able, but he must have really believed it because he put himself not only in a potentially harmful situation, but a deadly situation for himself, and just, why did he do that? How did he, how did he come to this point? How did, he, how did he go from just knowing God was able to actually believing it? 
Chapter 12, look at verse number 7. This is just a few years earlier at the beginning when Saul was made king. And this is Samuel speaking. Verse number 7 of chapter 12. Samuel speaks here. He says, Now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. When Jacob was coming to Egypt and your fathers cried unto the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt, and he made them to dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the hosts of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Verse 10, and they cried unto the Lord and said, we have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord, we have served Balaam and Ashtaroth, but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. And verse number 11, and the Lord sent Jerubbabel, and Bedan, and Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and ye dwelled safe. You know what our problem is many times, I think? We have short memories. You know, you read stories about, it's particularly in like Exodus, right? Children of Israel leave Egypt. God parts the Red Sea. They're in the desert heading towards Canaan. And they're like, oh, we have no food. We have no water, I think was the first thing maybe. God brings water out of a rock. It's like literally a couple days later, like, oh, we have no food. We should go back to Egypt. It was way better there. And God sends this miracle bread on the ground that they could go out and pick up every day. A couple days later, ah, we have no meat. Ah, we should go back to Egypt. It was so much better there. We were slaves. And God's like, all right, here you go. Here's some some birds. Over and over again, it was like, I'm like, you read some of the stories and like, do you guys not, do you not remember like when the sea parted and there was dry land that you walked across? where literally every day there's a pillar of fire that leads you where you're supposed to go. And then daytime, it's a cloud, which gives you shade. And it's like, God's like, I read the story. I'm like, what, 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 these people are like insane. But then I'm like, how often have I done that? How often has God done things in my life, incredible things? And then like the next day, I'm like, I run into a challenge. I'm like, oh God, what am I going to do? I have no idea how I'm going to move forward. And God's like, do you remember yesterday or last week or last year or the time and time and time and time and time and time and time again how I've proven myself to you, how I've cared for you, how I've provided for your needs, how I've watched over you? A couple of months ago when we started our deputation, we had to put together some of our materials and, you know, put some pictures together and things like that. And I was, I uh, got on my iCloud account I'm a cool guy now. I used to be Android, but now I'm Apple. Praise the Lord for that. Also, it makes it much easier for the NSA to spy on me, which is, which is great. I was looking through my iCloud, you know, for the past, I don't know, I think I got an, uh, an iPhone maybe when we were here in Florida, but it's at least six or seven, eight years of, of photos. And I was looking for something in particular, and I'm scrolling through how they separate it by month. You know, you can see the date. And as I'm scrolling through that several months ago, it's as, old, it's as if almost God is speaking to me and saying, hey, remember that? Remember this? Remember how I provided for your needs? Remember how you were wondering about what we were going to do? And I took care of you? Remember you had that struggle? I led you through? We have a short memory sometimes. Maybe the next time you're facing a challenge what you should do is stop and remember. Remember the goodness of God. God's not a genie. I'm not saying he's going to like poof appear and make your problem go away. But he'll be with you every step of the way. And as we step out in faith to follow him, as we take bold initiative, even when it maybe is not clear what exactly every detail that we like to know and have answered is there, What happens when we take that step is we demonstrate confidence in an all-powerful and a sovereign God. And then in verse three, and number three, and we're we're done here. Our time is our time is up. The bold initiative to take a step, right? Demonstrates his confidence in God, right? His faith and not just knowledge, but belief in what God was able to do. And then number three, God uses him to become a catalyst for deliverance. We won't take time to read through because our time is short, but I'll just give you the cliff notes. God wins. 
At the end of the chapter, if you read forward just a few verses, it said, and God delivered Israel that day. There's a savage little battle between uh, Jonathan and his armor bearer, which, again, remember that verse about how they're, the only people who had swords was Saul and Jonathan? So Saul has a sword, uh, or I'm sorry, Jonathan has a sword, and his armor bearer is with him, but I'm not sure what the armor bearer was using, maybe a rock or something. But there's a savage hand-to-hand battle. And oh, by the way, here's another little amazing little tidbit about it. You know who else was impacted by Jonathan's step of faith? The person that was closest to him. You think that the armor bearer would have done what he did had Jonathan not first taken that step? It got me thinking. Who is it in your life that God may want to impact but he's waiting for you and I to take a step of faith to follow him. The armor bearer wouldn't have been in the battle or would have experienced God's power and victory had Jonathan not first been willing to take that first bold bold step of initiative, right? The armor bearer gets to receive a blessing, not because he was the one that stepped out, but because Jonathan was faithful to trust God. And God used Jonathan to impact not only change his life and bring about a victory, but also impact the armor bearer's life. I'm not sure who you might be today. Maybe you're Jonathan. Maybe God's, God has something before you and he's waiting for you to take a step. Maybe you're the armor bearer. Maybe there's somebody in your life that God is waiting for them to take a step so that you can be a follower. And also experience God's power and see him do an amazing uh, work in your life. Ultimately, though, it's not about Jonathan. And what's most amazing about the story is that Jonathan knew that. He knew that it wasn't about him, it wasn't about his ability, his swordsmanship, or his training, or his background, certainly not his equipment. But it was about a powerful God that is ready to do incredible things. He's just looking for somebody to take a step of faith to follow him my challenge to you this morning is this. I'm not sure what opportunities God may be opening for you or doors he might have placed in your path, but can I encourage you? You want to see God's power? Take a step of faith. He will meet you every time. He's always faithful. He's always consistent. And guess what? He's not short on power. He's not short on resources. You know, we need support. We need financial support to go to Hong Kong, sure. But you know what? Ultimately, God's got plenty of money. Remember how he spoke a word and created the universe? Do you think a few thousand dollars are a problem for him? No. I think he's just waiting for us to say, you know what, Lord? I don't have all the answers. I don't know how it's all going to turn out. But what I do know is that you are able.